I was at the age of, I didn't go in at the age of 18, but at the age of 18 as a college student at Cypress College down the road here, had a philosophy class and uh, um, long story, but it led me to read everything I could get my hands on at the time about the resurrection of Jesus, which um, pretty much sealed things for me in terms of how this makes sense and why I'm a Christian today. Uh, so it's a big subject. Uh, if you did not get a chance to sign uh, anything, a sheet about getting on the mailing, mailing list, uh, we, we'll have some out there. There's one here, so if you want to do that, I'm on the mailing list. They are not intrusive into your life at all. You don't get, you don't get phone calls from Scott or anybody else asking if you want to buy a timeshare in Texas. So it's, it's actually not bad. Uh, it's, great, it's great information. They do have a magazine, as you saw out there, a publication that comes out. Great information. Um, you can go to their website, and their website, I, it's the smallest print website in existence. But there's a lot of stuff in there, and that's why it's small print. So uh, go to their website, biblearchaeology.org, Bible but you can do a search for Associates for Biblical Research, and it will come up. Um, so, and then, you know, there has been, and I kind of was hoping this may be the case, but if you would be interested in uh, going to do a dig with Associates for Biblical Research uh, within the next two years, let me know or just jot it down on a, on a piece of paper or something. As you just heard, there are no age limits here. So if you can get on a plane and walk um, and, and use a brush, not a shovel, then uh, they'll... they'll <laughs> They'll accept, uh, they'll accept it. It was really, when Bill and I first talked to Scott, we were on a Zoom call, and right in the middle of our conversation, Scott says, oh my gosh, it's the director of antiquities from Israel calling me right now. And he was polite enough not to go talk to him instead of us, which, had I been in Scott's shoes, I probably, hey guys, somebody more important is on the line. But um, this, this stuff is really, it, it's great. And I have relied on scholars like Scott my whole ministry career. What they do is absolutely uh, needed in, in evangelical circles, and they're doing a great job. So once again, let's just welcome Scott, and um, he'll, he'll do it. The only time frame we have, I think, is he has a flight at five, but he also is interested in watching the uh, finals of the women's NCAA tournament and Caitlin Clark. So yeah. I'll let him call when it ends. If you need to go, uh, then go, but uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cut the time short since we're not, um, we don't have anything on the back end of this, but, but about, an, you know, it'll be about an hour, but if you have to go, feel free to go. Uh, Scott will single you out on the way. Yeah. There you go. All right. I'll shame you. Don't you dare get up and leave while I'm speaking. So let's see if I can pull this off on my own. Um, it should be up here. Okay. There we go. So I, I'm using Garrett as a guinea. Okay, that's working. Ooh. All right, good. And then the side. Yep. yep. All right, and to advance the slides. Do I need to point up there when I'm advancing? That would be good. Okay, so hi. Y'all are gluttons for punishment. <laughs> Back, back for more. Well, thank you. It's been, been a fun day. Uh, to clarify something um, that um, was just mentioned to me, the, the chronology of the tabernacle temple. So you have the tabernacle, the tent at Shiloh, which is, uh, comes to an end about 1075 B.C. So the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines at the Battle of Ebenezer, which is 26 miles to the west of Israel. The Philistines are at Aphek, the Israelites are at Ebenezer, they battle, Hophni and Phinehas are killed, the Ark of the Covenant is captured, and for seven months it's in Philistine territory. Bad things happen to the Philistines and their gods along the way. They decide to get rid of it. They put it on an ox cart. It goes to Bet Shemesh, where these Israelite guys foolishly open it, and then God kills a bunch of them. And then ultimately, the ark goes up to Kidius Jadim, up into the hill country, and it's there for 20 years until David, in 2 Samuel 7, comes and brings it to Jerusalem to the city of David, not to the Temple Mount yet, but down near the Gihon Spring there is a tent which David pitches called David's Tabernacle. And so he brings it there. I did a, uh, if you go on YouTube to uh, 
TBNs in grace. I did a whole 30 minute program on that because we now know a lot about the, tab the uh, tabernacle of David that we didn't know before, which is really interesting. But it's there for, uh, for decades until the time of Solomon. And then Solomon is the one that brings, brings the ark up onto Mount Moriah when the temple is built in Jerusalem. So when I say there's a temple in Shiloh, all I mean is that the, the tent was replaced by a temple, not the temple. Okay, so when we, we tend to talk, talk about first temple period and second temple period, and it just depends on how you slice and dice the words. There, if you're saying there was a third temple at, at Shiloh, then you'd have to talk about, you'd have to redefine everything based on that. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay, any questions that we didn't deal with before? Anyone wants to ask? Am I, it feels like I'm getting a bit of a, does that sound okay to y'all? Okay, all right, well, here we go. Uh, death, burial, resurrection, the heart of the gospel message. This is what one believes when one becomes a Christian, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of primary importance. The Greek word here is protos, positional primary importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, if we have time at the end, you can ask me about how many hours was Jesus actually in the grave? You know, was it three days and three nights? Or, you know, was it 39 hours? And why that, you know, how we, how we do the math on that. So here is the temple area in the time of Jesus. I don't know if that's going to help. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. Her does a lot of good. Okay. Make the cats go crazy. Um, you, you see the temple area, the black line, that's where the walls were in A.D. 33. The other wall is built 11 years later by Agrippa in A.D. 44. So that wall didn't exist at the time of the crucifixion. It's just there to show you what was built 11 years later. So the place of the crucifixion is just outside that black line. Um, if you've been to Jerusalem, you might think of where Jaffa Gate is today. So just near Jaffa Gate would be the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and that would be the place of death, burial, and resurrection. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Um, imagine having five denominations share the same church building. I mean, you guys are sharing with someone else, but you're all in very good terms with Pastor Jorge, or was that his name? All right. so, um, everybody's getting along fine, but you know, you've got your lines drawn and how this all works. Imagine with five denominations you were sharing, it could get a little dicey. And then imagine that we throw in 10 to 20,000 visitors a day into your church. And now things get super complicated. But this is the epicenter. Uh, underneath all this, if you can pull this back, I could walk you around Jerusalem. You know, if you don't know, the untrained eye, you just simply don't know. Um, the most amazing thing in the world can be there, but you don't know. But it, like you peel back buildings and you can see remnants of the first wall, second wall, third wall, this, that. I mean, it's all still there but you have to be able to peel back modernity. Um, so this is the epicenter, and you can see the entrance to the, to the church right there in the center, and uh, quite uh, an important place in Christendom. The history of it's fascinating because um, the, it was a stone quarry in the first century. And so the way you make money, if you own land in that area near the temple, that's good real estate. You, and there's a building boom going on in Jerusalem. So they're quarrying stone, not randomly, but specific sizes of blocks for the construction projects that Herod has, has going. So you're making money quarrying the stone, but you're quarrying it so that you're creating tombs in the process. So you're creating a necropolis in the process of quarrying all the stone. So you're making a lot of money selling the stone, and then you sell the necropolis with all the tombs. Again, so you're doubling up on your, on your profit. So when you get underneath that, that's what you have. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem the second time in the year AD 36 under Hadrian, Hadrian they was so mad at the Jews at this point. Uh, another revolt, you gotta be kidding me. And it cost Rome a lot of time and money and then they wipe everything out. Because in AD 70, when Titus destroyed the city, he left something standing to show what a great city he had conquered. The three towers inside Jaffa Gate, 
Fasael, Hippicus, Mariamne, and some other things left standing. But after the second revolt, they wiped out everything. And Hadrian had, on top of this spot, had a temple of Jupiter built there. And this temple of Jupiter stands until... Um, the time of Constantine. So after Constantine's conversion, when his mo- I'm not sure how sincere his conversion was, but his mother Helena had a very sincere uh, conversion. She comes to Jerusalem at about 320, and the first she wants to identify the holy places. And so um, everyone tells her that this, this is you know, where this happened. So the emperor, an emperor by the name of Macarius, bishop of Jerusalem, um, is, is given, gives the order to... Uh, tear down the temple of Jupiter, and to remove all the debris, you could call it the first modern excavation, if you want to call it that. I'm sure it was very crude, but I mean, they moved all the soil and got down to the, you know, the tomb and the things that were uh, there. It's a really interesting history of the Temple Mount. <clears throat> so let's talk about Jesus' death. Uh, we know more about this than you might imagine. We have actually excavated crucifixion victims with the nails still in them. And so we, we do understand the practice pretty well. We know what the historical sources say. Um, <clears throat> here's what uh, Quintilian writes in uh, the declarations. This is a late first century. He says, whenever we crucify the condemned, we choose the most crowded roads where this terror can impact the most people. For the penalties relate not so much to retribution as to their exemplary effect. In other words, we're going to do it publicly so that it is a political statement to everyone. Now, Roman citizens are not beaten and Roman citizens are not crucified. This is why when they beat Paul and they find out he's a Roman citizen, there's a scandal, like we could be called into account by Caesar for this. So the Romans were brutal, but they did take citizenship rights pretty seriously. So um, women were not uh, beaten, women were not crucified. Only non-citizen men were beaten or, or crucified. And let's face it, most of the criminals prob- came from that you know, subset of the population. Um, and the Romans are going to make an example of them. And um, most men do not even survive the beating. Um, it is a brutal uh, process that lays the organs open, destroys the genitalia. It's, the person is naked when this happens. Um, it's quite a brutal process. Jesus is in vigorous health. I mean, he's uh, 33 years old. He's been running a construction company for over a decade. He's been walking all over creation, his creation. But um, <clears throat> so he's in very vital, vigorous health. He does survive the the beating. He is um, then crucified and lives on the cross for for six hours. So the crucifixion, we know, as I say, quite a bit about it. The man who helped Jesus carry his cross, Simon, who's mentioned in the Bible, Simon of Cyrene, he's an African. Um, His ossuary, I'm going to show you in a minute what ossuaries look like. They're bone boxes with names on them. And that of his son, Alexander, have survived. And so they're real historical people. And so when we, we roll through this stuff, I want you to understand we're talking about real people, real places, and real events. Um, Titus, uh, Josephus writes about this, a Jewish historian in the late first century, non-Christian. He writes, General Titus's main reason for not stopping the crucifixions was the hope that the spectacle might perhaps induce the Jews to surrender. Now, this is during the siege of Jerusalem, the great Jewish revolt, AD 66 to 70, which culminates in the destruction of the second temple. The same day of the year that the first temple had been destroyed, August the 28th. The first temple was destroyed on August 28th. The second temple is destroyed on August 28th. An inescapable sign of the judgment of God. I mean, if you miss that, you've missed it all. Um, what he's talking about here is the crucifixions during the Jewish war. So they are crucifying 500 a day. And then the Roman catapults, they put the dead bodies on the Roman catapults and they shoot them up onto the Temple Mount. 500 a day. Imagine the stench, the disease, the the horror of this, okay, first of all, being crucified and then being catapulted and, you know, your body becomes a weapon. Um, Again, the same point is to make a spectacle because the Romans kept giving terms of surrender, which the Jews kept rejecting. You know, the the terms kept getting worse and worse the longer that they waited until finally there were no more terms. It was going to be annihilation. 
<clears throat> now here's our text in John uh, 19. Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic, remember we we're talking about Aramaic is the underlying language here. Uh, it's called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle, as it should have been. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth. Remember that. The Romans knew enough to call him Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Multilingual society. And then Jesus would have known Hebrew as well. Verse 21, the chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. Did you know that the oldest fragment of the New Testament that we have to date, maybe we'll find older ones uh, with time, but the oldest fragment is a first century fragment of the Gospel of John. And it's John chapter 18, verse 31, Jesus before Pontius Pilate. And the fra it's, we call it P P52, that's from the John Rylands collection. And there you have the question before Pontius Pilate. When Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? The oldest surviving portion of the New Testament we have. What is truth? What a poignant question, right, for us to, to ask ourselves. What is truth? The truth was standing right in front of him. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the truth. Pilate says, what is truth? It says they divided his garments among them. We're going to talk about those garments in a minute. Uh, here's Josephus' account in Antiquities 18.33. There was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was Christ, and when Pilate, notice how Pilate keeps, the historical Pilate keeps appearing in this. The, the Apostles' Creed has, has sealed Pilate's ignominy forever, crucified under Pontius Pilate. And here we have it in the sources. Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross. Those that loved him at first did not forsake him, and for he appeared to them alive again the third day. So here you have outside the Bible a testimony, first century account of how he died, when he died, because we know the years of Pilate's reign, and that he was raised from the dead. Multiple extra biblical sources uh, say this. You see, as an archaeologist, I can prove to you when Jesus died, where Jesus died, and how Jesus died. What I cannot prove to you is that he died in your place. You see, that's a work of the Spirit. That, that must be a revelation that you have, that your sins were vicariously laid upon him. And if you believe that, incidentally, congratulations, you're a Christian. If you don't, you're not yet. Yeah, you may be a seeker, you may be interested, you may be working through things, but you're not yet a Christian. One of the most misquoted verses I've ever heard is John 10, 9 and 10. For if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made to salvation. What did I leave out? If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. That's what you've got to confess and believe. This is Tacitus, early first century Roman historian, Annals 1544, very reputable Roman historian. He writes, Nero, so this is mid-60s, fastened the guilt of the burning of Rome in 64 uh, and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. Now, why did they hate Christians so much? They called them atheists because they didn't believe in the gods. Atheos. They were against belief in the gods. 
And the Romans hated that. It wasn't that they believed in their God. It's that they refused to worship the other gods. And they're hated, it says. This is a Roman historian around the year 100 or a little after that telling us this. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty. That's crucifixion. During the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators. Here it is again. Pontius Pilate. Notice his title is procurator. Let's talk about that for just a minute. The New Testament, the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, give his title as prefect. Tacitus says his title was procurator. So pre-1961, guess what the big debate was? You can't trust the New Testament. Because according to Tacitus, Pilate's title was procurator. This proves that the New Testament was written later in the second century, so there are no eyewitness accounts. And then in 1961, with the excavations at Caesarea Maritima, what do we have? The Pontius Pilate inscription. The name of Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate with his title given, and his title is prefect. The very title given by the New Testament writers. In actuality, it was proving all along the eyewitness accounts. So Tacitus is writing two generations later. The title may have changed by that point, and now they're called procurator. So what they thought was actually disproving the New Testament was one of the greatest proofs ever. Now, you understand no one apologizes when these things happen. They just move on to the next matter. These are crucifixion nails. Uh, these are nails from the Abba Cave in Jerusalem. And we know the person who was crucified because his name was written on his, his ossuary. He was the last of the Hasmonean rulers. And Herod had him, accused him of sedition. And probably, that was not guilty, but anyway, Herod was a megalomaniac and paranoid. He had him uh, beheaded and crucified. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> overkill, literally, um, beheaded and crucified, and the poor guy's head and his body with the nails still in them are found. And the, the white on those nails is calcification. That's bone still on the nails. Now, the, the, the nails are through the wrist, not through the hand. All the examples that we have found archaeologically, the nails are here. Keep that in mind, because in a minute I'm going to show you some, exam some examples of medieval art. And I'm a student of art. Medieval artists, 100% of the time, portrayed the crucifixion. It was their favorite topic of painting. They portrayed it always as nailed here. So when people tell you, for example, that the Shroud of Turin was a medieval forgery, in a minute I'm going to show you where the, where the nails uh, were, were driven on this crucifixion victim in the Shroud of Turin. They're here, not here. So here's Aristobulus. Uh, nails still in him. <clears throat> Here is the famous heel bone of Yohanan. Uh, Yohananan, and uh, this is the actual heel bone. Usually what people see pictures of are the replicas of this. But this is the actual heel bone. Again, we know his name because it's inscribed on his ossuary, which goes to show us that even crucifixion victims had burial. And some of these crazy guys in the Jesus movement, like uh, John Dominic Crossan and so forth, they've written all kinds of things. And they sound really authoritative, you know. They wouldn't have buried crucifixion victims. He's proof that they did. That was found in his ossuary in the nail bone uh, through the heel. And you can see where it hit a knot probably, and that's why the, the nail built, uh, bent and was left right there. The nail is 11.5 centimeters. All the examples that we have found are 11.5 centimeters. They're not big spikes like you might picture in Byzantine art. Again, the Byzantines didn't know. They're guessing at what crucifixion looked like, okay? So now we know it's not that big of a nail. The purpose of the nail was not to keep the body on the cross. They used ropes for that. The purpose of the nail is to inflict maximum pain. So let's talk about the burial. Um, burial matters, and there are several reasons why I think we should think about this. It, when it's very core to our faith, uh, believing in the burial of Jesus, but uh, it explains some of Jesus' teaching. For example, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Lord, uh, I want to follow you, uh, but let me, let me bury my father. And Jesus says something that seems to be very crass, very cold. What did he say? 
Let the dead bury the dead. Wow, Jesus. I mean, they, they, got, they bury same day. They still do to this day. Like, there's no embalming. If somebody dies, they're buried the same day. Arab and Jew. So, like, the guy can't go to his dad's funeral. <laughs> What's Jesus' point? Okay, they're practicing secondary burial. So when the body decomposes after 12 months, the bones are gathered into an ossuary, into a bone box, and the funeral occurs after one year, one year after death. So what was the rich young ruler really saying to Jesus? It's an excuse. He's not serious about following Jesus. Again, you see how the, our, the, the study of the material culture helps us illuminate these passages. Um, secondly, it explains some of the events of the first Easter, like why the women visited the tomb when they did and what they were intending to do. Uh, spoiler alert, they weren't expecting a resurrection. They went carrying spices. You don't carry spices with you if you're not expecting anyone to be there, okay? So there's a grieving, a mourning tradition. There's a way that things are done. And then number three, it helps us correct errors in some popular books and documentaries. How many of you know in March of every year, some crazy stuff that comes out, okay? Some new documentary, some new thing about, uh, because let's face it, the, it doesn't get any bigger than Jesus. And, you know, that time of year, you're going to see a lot of that stuff. So, as I said, burial occurs the same day of death. We have a couple of scriptures that reflect that. Luke 7, 12, as he drew near to the gate of the city, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. So, same day burial, there's a procession that takes place. The body is, is buried before sundown. Now, first century tombs are different from tombs in different time periods. There's a typology, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And so they're always built a certain uh, way. Only about 10 to 15 percent of first century tombs had ro round rolling stones that covered the opening. They had 85 to 90 percent of them had square rolling stones or plugs, if you will, that, that seal the entrance. You still roll them away, like you, you move it out and you get under it and you roll it once, you roll it twice. So you still roll around a, a square stone. Um, but it's not exactly what you may have thought, because only uh, 10 to 15 percent are actually round. Uh, Mark 9, 23, and when Jesus came to the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd making a tumult. So this is the grieving process. If you read about the satire of Mark Twain, for example, in the mid-19th centuries, making fun of... 19th century America and our grieving traditions and processes and funerals. And then he traveled to Israel, you know, wrote Innocence Abroad and uh, did the same thing about, about that. Um, so there were seven days of mourning. Uh, from Josephus, we read that Archelaus, one of the sons of Herod, he's mentioned once in the New Testament, continued to mourn for seven days out of respect for his father. In Genesis 50:10, Joseph made a mourning for his father seven days. Uh, 1 Samuel 31, 13, they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So this is normally the, the initial grieving period. Now, they believe, though, that the spirit has already left the body uh, by that point, which I'll get to in a minute. There are four major changes that happen just before the time of Jesus. And they happen as a result of the Roman occupation. Have you ever wondered why, like, at the end of Malachi, everything is good, we're an independent nation, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, all this is good. And you open Matthew, and you're under cruel, brutal military occupation. So how did this happen? Well, here's the thing. In 63 B.C., the Syrians are attempting to take over Israel again. So they had done this under Antiochus IV. The Jerusalem temple is defiled and desecrated and all this. You have the Maccabean revolt. Um, they regain their independence. And then again, the Syrians are trying to take over. And so they write a letter that has money in Maccabean rulers, write a letter to an emerging power on the world stage named Rome. And they ask Rome for help, for protection. And Rome sends none other than Pompey Magnus himself. Pompey is named after him, the greatest of the Roman generals. So Pompey arrives in 63 BC. And oh, they, get, they scare off the, the Syrians. But Rome never leaves. And once the camels, and I mean a camel, not a rope. Once, 
once the camel's head is in the tent, you're sleeping with fleas, okay? And, and that's just the way that it is. So when you open the pages of the New Testament, that's why that tension is there. In response to this, there are four major changes that take place in late Second Temple period Judaism that the earlier writers, first, second century people reading the Gospels knew all that, which we don't. I mean, we got distance to deal with. So here they are. Number one is baptism. They begin to practice daily immersion in water. Every man, every woman, every day. They did not do that before that time. Now they begin to hyper apply Leviticus 11, 13, 15, these purity chapters and about uh, becoming impure. If you read the New Testament again, just uh, do it on your own. Go, go through and read and make note of all the paranoia. These people, I, did she touch you? Why did he touch her? Why didn't they wash their hands? You didn't wash your feet correctly. I mean, this is weird. And we just can read right over it. But I mean, you just start getting the totality of that. There's a paranoia, okay, about how you're transferring ritual impurity. There's a lot of ways that, that this can happen. But it's sort of when you were a kid, maybe the game of cooties. Or two or three years ago, it was called COVID. Okay, it's just like this is paranoia that exists. Um, so that's number one, daily immersion in water. Every man, every woman, every day. Over 1,000 of these baptistries have been excavated. I personally have excavated five of them, 38 of them on the Temple Mount, okay? So on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people get baptized, yeah, hello, because there's 38 baptistries right there. Yeah. <laughs> Someone was listening to one of my videos. That's good, okay. So where was I? Oh, yeah, so... All these baptistries, um, think about Peter on the day of Pentecost. When Peter gives this Pentecost sermon, 3,000 people get baptized. Yay, this is, this is great. But what Pastor Mike may not have told you <laughs> is that they were going to get baptized regardless of if Peter ever preached. They got baptized the day before and they got baptized the day after. They were going up on the Temple Mount. You can't go up on the Temple Mount unless you go through ritual immersion. Now, I'm not talking about hygienic washing. They're not taking a bar of soap down in there. It's a ritual process that they're going through. The, the Pentecost miracle is that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what changed everything. They've been baptized every day of their lives, okay? Now it changed because of Jesus. That was the big, big difference. All right, so that's number one. Number two is the usage of stone vessels instead of clay vessels. Clay is susceptible to ritual purity. I quoted it this morning in Leviticus 11. When your pottery, your ceramic pottery, becomes impure, says the Lord, you must break it. Doesn't say anything about stone vessels. Don't you love religion? <laughs> There's always a way to beat the system. And so they start carving them out of Jerusalem limestone. And on Sabbath, on festivals, on weddings and so forth, you use only stone vessels, not clay, because you can't afford to become ritually impure. You miss the wedding. Speaking of, what was Jesus' first miracle? John 2. He turns water into wine at a wedding. What kind of jars were those in John 2? Stone jars. Stone, it specifically says. That's that ritual purity culture of the first century. Um, so big change in that. Number three is oselegium. So this is set the secondary burial that I've started to explain to you, how they're gathering the bones after one year into a secondary burial process. The fourth one I also mentioned earlier today, which is the usage of first century BC coins on into the first century AD because they don't want to use these Roman coins. The, 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 they're using their old Jewish coins, which harken back to a time of independence. All right, so let's unpack oselegium, reburial after one year. Uh, the Mishnah says, uh, when the flesh had wasted away, they gathered the bones and buried them in their own place. Uh, the Semachot, my son, bury me at first in a fosse in the course of time, collect my bones, and then put them into an ossuary. And then from the Babylonian Talmud, 12 months later, this is the process of that time. We have lots of ossuaries that we have excavated. 
and you may find this super interesting, like, why are they doing this? Uh, like, Rahmani says that maybe it was the Pharisaic belief in the resurrection of the dead. So, remember, Sadducees don't believe there's a re resurrection. Pharisees believe that there is. And so maybe it has something to do with that. He posits uh, Lee Levin and Gideon Forrester think about Roman influence because the Romans also practiced a form of secondary burial. But in my view, it is this obsession with a wave of ritual purity that has swept through late Second Temple period Judaism. Now, I did a lecture on this last, exactly one year ago, at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., on um, the wave of ritual purity in late Second Temple period Judaism, which, Judaism, which I think you can access online. This is a famous tomb in the Kidron Valley in Jerusalem, this very, very large, fancy sort of a tomb. It's called Absalom's tomb. It has nothing to do with Absalom. It's misnamed. It's a first century tomb. Remember when uh, Jesus says in Matthew 23, Woe to you, Pharisees! You are like whitewashed tombs. You paint the outside of your tombs, and on the inside are dead men's bones. So these are very fancy sorts of tombs. The common person's tomb is different from this. This is a tomb that I excavated 10 miles north uh, of Jerusalem. It is a, a typical quintessential first century tomb. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for not making a run on the stage, though. <laughs> Jack, don't worry. John, Acts, Romans, okay. Hey, thanks, Chuck. You think I'm going to lose my train of thought? You're wrong. This is a first century tomb that I excavated 10 miles north of Jerusalem. It's shaped like a human hand. So you have benches where the body is laying. Let me back up. Before the late Second Temple period, Iron Age tombs, like if you go to the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem, which a lot of people want to be the tomb of Christ, it can't be because it's not this shape. Um, so there's a bench, and the bones, after a year, they gather the bones, and there's a repository underneath. Those bones go into this repository. The next family member dies. His bones go into the same repository. So the biblical phrase, he was gathered to his fathers. So that's, that's the picture. That garden tomb has five more just like it on the property next door, the, what's called the Ecobib League. So it's a whole series of Iron Age tombs. Now, Second Temple period tombs look like this. You've still got the benches. But after the body decomposes, the bones are gathered and put into a bone box and pushed back into these niches. About 20, 25% of these have ossuaries, have names inscribed on them. You can have 50, 60, 70 family members all buried in the same tomb. So this is why the Gospels are very clear that Jesus was buried in a tomb where a man had never been lain. As a Westerner, you might think, like, why would you ever put someone in someone else's tomb? It's because of this process of oselegium or secondary burial. Here's a fragment of an ossuary that we excavated, also uh, Kirby Del Makater. This is the most famous ossuary of all. This is the James ossuary, as in James, the brother of Jesus, as in the author of the epistle of James, as in the leader of the, Christ, uh, uh, leader of the Christian church for three decades after Jesus. Uh, this is James. He is martyred in the year 62. Josephus uh, writes about the martyrdom of James also. Um, he is pushed from the southeast corner of the Temple Mount, what's called the pinnacle of the temple, uh, down into the Kidron Valley, and both legs by the Jewish authorities. Um, and he's still alive, and he's not a young man at this point. And they go down with clubs and beat him to death. I mean, you've got to love a good religious leader. I mean, just, you know, can beat this guy to death. This is James. And it says in Aramaic, <laughs> here we go again, from right to left, seven-word inscription, James son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. 
Let me tell you, this was a firestorm. And the reaction against this, it can't possibly be. It must be a forgery. It must be blah, 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 blah. Um, they seized this ossuary from Ode Golan. The owner uh, fined him and all this. He countersued. He won at the Israeli Supreme Court a massive judgment against the Israel Antiquities Authority. And... Um, some justice there, and it is now in his possession. But there it is. That's what a, an ossuary looks like made of Jerusalem limestone. It has only left Israel twice, once to, to Toronto when it was first came to light, and it is in Dallas right now. And so if life, but not for much longer, it's called the Nazarene Experience. It's on display in Dallas. And so if life takes you to Texas for any reason in the near future, just look that up. The Nazarene Experience. You'll probably hate the rest of your life if you don't go see this. Okay. And like if you go tomorrow, you can see the eclipse and this, I guess. And plus you'd be in Texas. Thank you, Bill. This is another very famous ossuary. This is Caiaphas' ossuary. His name is uh, inscribed on here, uh, Caiaphon, Joseph Caiaphas. And uh, this is the one who condemned Jesus to death. Again, real people, real places, real events, and a very ornate, fancy sort of an ossuary in the Israel Museum today. And uh, here are nails that were found um, in his tomb. And it's very interesting. There was an obsession with crucifixion nails in the first century. It's very macabre. And I'm not suggesting that these were crucifixion nails because they're not the right size. Maybe those nails were used to scratch his name into, into the side of the ossuary. But there have been many ossuaries, and we have written sources, that show the obsession they had with crucifixion nails, that sort of uh, like the power of this deceased person was in these nails or something like this. And so you did have people getting buried with crucifixion nails doesn't mean that they were crucified necessarily weird right here's a very famous tomb this this is the necropolis at dominus flevit on the mount of olives just up above the garden of gethsemane remember jesus left the disciples snoozing in the garden of gethsemane and it says he went away a short distance by himself there he, here's here's where he likely comes to it's just up above and we it's dominus flevit which in latin means god wept which you think of Jesus at the Mount of Olives looking over the city and weeping um, because of their refusal to, to repent. Now, this is super, super interesting. Look at all of these ossuaries here of different sizes, child ossuaries, and it's got to be long enough for the femur bone, longest bone in the body. Um, 500 ossuaries here at this site. Many of them, are you sitting down? Many of them with Christian iconography scratched in them, crosses and fish. You are looking here at the very first Jesus followers. Jews who had accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah. They had become followers. And now it's reflected in their... They're still being buried the way a typical Jew would be buried at the time. They're, they've now embraced Jesus as the Messiah. Think about Matthew 27, 51 to 53. When Jesus came out of the grave, many others came out of their graves at the same time and were seen walking around Jerusalem. Some of you are thinking, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Yeah. You see, Easter's not about one empty tomb. It's about hundreds of empty tombs. And one day it'll be about many thousands of empty tombs. So this, for me, is one of the most important spots in Jerusalem because I believe you're at ground zero for resurrection at that point. Now, they believe that the spirit departed after three days. So the spirit still hovers around the body until it starts to decompose. And when it does, then the spirit take, takes off. This is very common belief in late Second Temple period Judaism. This is what makes the story of Lazarus so phenomenal. They freak out that Jesus arrives on the fourth day. Lord, if you had only gotten here sooner, then we could believe in resurrection, okay? But it's the fourth day. He stinketh. <laughs> if only you'd gotten here, because the Spirit's already departed. And Jesus goes, I am the resurrection, okay? Don't worry, I got this. Um, so we have a couple of passages that deal with this, the, the, the issue of the spirit lingering over the body for three days. Um, skeletal remains are super interesting. We study all of these human skeletal remains. We can tell the pathologies. It's my estimate 
that the average person, at about 25% of the population at any time, had acute illness. That's a lot. Like one out of four people, like major uh, illness. About 70% had some form of disease, some pathology at any given time. And just think about it. I mean, like, let's imagine right now I forbid you for the next week to take any pills. Not a person in this room gets to take a pill. Oh, and those of you wearing glasses, off they go. Contacts too. Now, how did your life just change? Okay? That's what it was like in the first century. There was pain and suffering uh, sim as simple as an abscess tooth. You know, that's, that's right next to your brain, and you can die from an abscess tooth. So when they hear that Jesus of Nazareth is healing people and not charging, no wonder the multitudes are thronging to him. Now here's the lunar eclipse of A, uh, AD 33. I personally took this picture. <clears throat> this is a lunar eclipse, but uh, my, what I want to point out to you is that NASA can do some pretty amazing stuff uh, these days. Some things they can't do, but some things are pretty amazing. We can now calculate with precision when eclipses occurred in the past. And because there's a regularity to the universe, that's the way that God made it. And so we have historical sources like the uh, Assyrian Eponym calendar, for example, very specific on when, uh, and they link it to the reigns of certain kings in Assyria. That's how we build our biblical chronology in the Old Testament, because we can link some of those kings are also mentioned in the Old Testament. And then we can link back. And that's how we can be really confident in the date of the building of Solomon's temple in 967. We're going back to eclipses, which occur at predictable times. We can tell you exactly when the next one is going to occur, for example, now. Um, so this becomes very interesting because we have some important eclipses mentioned in the Bible. Like at the time of Jonah, we know that there was an eclipse in the mid-9th century B.C. over Nineveh and then a series of ecological disasters, and then Jonah shows up, and they all repent. Well, what did ancient people see in celestial phenomena? They read into this meant something to them. Even in later times, the College of Augurs, for example, they made big decisions. Do we go to war or not go to war based on the direction of the lightning? Is it from the east to the west or the west to the east? Because east to the west is a bad omen, west to the east is a good omen. Think about what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse. As lightning from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. When they heard that, they went, whoa, east to the west, it's going to be bad, all right? That was, that was the whole point of what they heard when he said this. There are a lot of written sources about this. So we now know that there was a uh, lunar eclipse on April the 3rd, A.D. 33. And we know that just before Herod the Great died, there was a solar eclipse. So now we can pinpoint the, the death of Herod, which we can pinpoint the birth of Jesus to 1 BC. Now remember, there is no year zero. So you go right from 1 BC to 1 AD. And so we've got Jesus in birth in 1 BC, crucifixion, Friday of Passover week in the spring of AD 33, which in our calendar, they're on a lunar calendar, we're on a solar calendar, but the equivalent of that would be um, April 3rd, AD 33. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Since this big eclipse tomorrow, I thought y'all might be interested in this. Jesus is nailed to the cross at nine in the morning. That's the time of the morning sacrifice. Look it up. He hangs on the cross for six hours until three in the afternoon. That's the time of the evening sacrifice. We call that afternoon. They called it evening. Two sacrifices every day. Nailed to the cross, fulfilling the first one. Takes his last breath, fulfilling the last one. At noon, after Jesus has been hanging on the cross for three hours, the Bible says there was darkness that covered the whole land for three hours. That's not an eclipse. Eclipses don't last for three hours. We don't know what caused it. Most likely something like a sandstorm, which happened pretty commonly in that part of the world and can become very dark, or it could have been something supernatural. Maybe God covered the covered. I don't know. But what I do know is that a few hours later, there was a lunar eclipse. And so I want you to think about the chronology with me for just a moment. Jesus dies at three in the afternoon. Sundown is at 530 or six. 
It's Passover. It's not just any Shabbat. It's the holiest Shabbat of the year. Now, what all has to happen in the next couple of hours? This has got to be real, real fast. You've got to go to Pilate. Not everybody can just immediately get into Pilate. So Joseph of Arimathea has got to get to Pilate's Praetorium. He's got to get an audience with Pilate. He's got to get permission to take the body off the cross and to bury it, get back to the burial place, and probably they gave him something in writing so that to know that he had permission, uh, get back there and then do it. I mean, you have to remove the nails and uh, the body from the cross. They wash the body. They wrap the body. They carry the body to a nearby tomb, prepare the body in the tomb. All this takes some time, okay? And we've only got two and a half hours or something to work with here. So sun is going to go down and Shabbat's going to be there. By the time the stone is rolling, whether it's a round or whether it's a square, by the time the stone is going over to seal the tomb, they turn around, they're on their way home, and on the horizon, here comes the moon, and there's an eclipse. That's scientific proof. We know there was an eclipse that day. And we also know that it was what you would call a, this has been published in multiple peer-reviewed journals, incidentally, what you would call a blood moon. Um, it's a, a reddish moon on the rise. So, the sun has turned to darkness and the moon into blood. Let's go back to Peter's Passover sermon, a Pentecost sermon. Let's see why all those 3,000 people were so eager to repent. He says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That it will come to pass in the last day, says the Lord. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even on your handmaidens and servants in that day will I pour out of my spirit, says the Lord. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes to pass. And whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is that, he says. They have just seen the sun turn into darkness. They've just seen, normally what happens, you take a, a, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you arrive at Passover, you stay till Pentecost, and then you go home. Many of these people had just seen the sun turn to darkness and the moon into blood. No wonder they were impacted so heavily by this. I hope with all of this eclipse mania tomorrow, you'll have, a, have to have some conversations with some people about how eclipses were used in the Bible to accomplish God's will as well. Now, that's a lot of detail that I just talked about there. Let's get to the resurrection. Um, John 23 through 7, Peter then came out with the other disciple and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter. Don't you feel bad for Peter? Like for all eternity, like he's the slowest runner, okay? <laughs> So he gets outrun and they and reach the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Mention one. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying in the napkin, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. So here's the burial clothes of Jesus mentioned in the fourth gospel. This is typical medieval art. You can see they're guessing at what this clothing uh, would have looked like and where the nails would have been. This is the Shroud of Turin. I, um, until recent years, was not a believer in the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. I just didn't want to investigate it. It seemed too good to be true. I didn't want to, like my reputation as an archaeologist, I don't want to be called that guy or, you know, seem real Catholic to me or, I don't know. It just, just seemed too good to be true. And when I investigated this for myself, I have changed my mind. And I now believe that this is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. Now, you'll be able to read my reasons. I was telling Pastor Mike that I wrote the archaeological supplement for a new study Bible that's coming out later this year, the Open Study Bible, and I include this in there. So, you know, you can check all this out for yourself, but I'll just give you a few things to think about. Clearly... I mean, if it were to be a medieval forgery, I'd have no idea how they'd come up with this. Now, I told you what NASA can do. Now, let me tell you what NASA can't do. NASA cannot replicate this. 
there's no explanation for how this image is imprinted. And it is a crucifixion victim. Now, I cannot prove to you that it's Jesus of Nazareth, but I don't know any other crucifixion victim that we have a written account of something supernatural, supernatural power or energy that might create this, and with a crown of thorns, as you can see, and with lacerations uh, all over, and with wounds in the wrist, not in the, in the hands, and it goes on and on and on. Now, incidentally, this person is about six feet tall, which is surprising to us. We think of Jesus as maybe being of average stature. He's actually taller than the average person would have been. This crucifixion victim was, uh, has a beard, has wounds all over him. This is what is imprinted on the shroud. Now, the, the Vatican allowed in 1979 the Sturp team to come in and to study and to photograph the, the shroud. The photographer for that team is a man named Barry Schwartz. He is an agnostic Jew. That's his name you see there. He's the one who sent me these photos. Barry Schwartz became a Christian through photographing this. Okay, he was, as I said, an agnostic Jew until he studied the Shroud of Turin. Here are all the wounds. Uh, you can share this pick if you want with everyone, but here you see all the different wounds that the New Testament mentioned, and you can see them on the, on the shroud. Here's a close-up of the wrist. One wrist is being covered, but on the other wrist, you can see where the trauma is on the wrist, not in the, the hand. And here's the face. <clears throat> Blood spatter as if from a crown of thorns uh, on the face. Here's a very interesting fact. We know that people buried uh, people with coins in their eyes, but for some reason, like, it, it never dawned on me that the Jews might have done the same thing. But that was a typical burial custom of the, of the day. And you will see, here, I realize these pictures are grainy, but um, I think there's general agreement that there are coins in the eye sockets here. And you can see one of them pretty clearly. This is a coin of none other than Pontius Pilate. Now you tell me how a medieval forger would have even known what a coin of Pontius Pilate was. Talk about linking with Pontius Pilate, it's unbelievable. The shroud was in a fire 500 years ago in Turin, Italy. Imagine let's, that this is the burial cloth of Jesus came that close to being gone. And as it was, it was damaged. And so 500 years ago, it was patched. And you can see the patch here. Um, this is a, these are Barry Schwartz's uh, photos. And they're already starting to pull away from, from the garment because, you know, new wine, old wineskins type of, type of an idea. Well, the Vatican did allow carbon dating, and here's what they did. Not wanting to damage the shroud, they took loose fibers. Guess where they pulled the loose fibers from? The patch! <laughs> and yes, the patch is 500 years old. And so you, you get this contradictory carbon date, and that's the problem. You say, well, why don't they just do new carbon dating? All right, well, I mean, put yourself in the Vatican's position. You know, we're just going to cut, cut off a piece of Jesus' garment, you know, so we can do carbon dating. It's, it's not as easy as it seems. Uh, the, the red blood, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. That's the high tech of 1979, ladies and gentlemen. And that is Barry Schwartz doing the photography uh, of the shroud. This is a herringbone pattern on the shroud. The herringbone pattern is only used for a limited period of time in history. I know this because we have a tomb in Jerusalem called the leper's tomb where a first century burial shroud uh, intact. We have a complete shroud and that's the same pattern this herringbone pattern. It is no longer done that way in the Byzantine period, certainly not in the medieval period. We also have extinct pollen on the shroud. Pollen that went extinct in the Byzantine period. It had been extinct for a thousand years, 
by the time the medieval artist, you know, supposedly could have done this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Extinct pollen. Would they just plant it there or something? Now, why is there red blood stains? Because it should be black. So there is a, a, a condition that occurs when the liver is traumatized and it produces, instead of black bilirubin, it is red. And this is very consistent with what you would expect. The, the torture destroys the organs and produces this effect. Here's a close-up. And if you are a Christian, if you consider the, that this might be the burial cloth of Jesus, you are looking at the blood of Jesus. And if, if that doesn't do it, I don't know what will do it. Other factors, uh, limestone particles, carbon dating, and so forth. Just so many things going into the study today. This is my friend Jody Magnus, professor at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. She is uh, no believer. In fact, she's an atheist. She's also an expert in late Second Temple Period Judaism and early Christianity. So go figure. And uh, Jody's a renowned author and speaker and so forth. And she says the Gospels get it right when you study the death of Jesus. Those details given to you in the gospel are exactly the way that those burial practices were done at the time. This is the Nazareth inscription. Remember Jesus of Nazareth over the cross, um, found in Nazareth in 1878, and it's in the Israel Museum today. So it's either from Tiberius Caesar or Claudius Caesar, one or the other. It's an imperial decree. I, Caesar, great and mighty, do hereby decree that anyone who steals bodies from graves in Palestine will be put to death. Not the whole Roman Empire, just Palestine. Seems like we got a problem with bodies disappearing from graves in Palestine around AD 33. Remember that Matthew 27, 51? Many others came out of their graves at the same time. And then where do they post it? They post it in Nazareth. And Jesus was known, even on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth. Archaeological confirmation of resurrection. We have synchronisms, uh, as you might imagine. This could, could uh, pertain to either Claudius or, or um, Tiberius. This is Tiberius on the left, Claudius on the right. Either way, it's a powerful synchronism, I believe, taken with the Shroud of Turin, uh, those two things together, giving us extra biblical archaeological insight onto the resurrection. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one. I read for you earlier, and that's the end of my talk. So I think we got maybe a few minutes for questions. Yes, yes, sir. Very good, yes. Somebody answered the question for me, but to my knowledge, they have not. Um, yeah. And I don't know that they have adequate samples to, to test, yeah. 